<laughs> well, hey, I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to do this and, uh, you know, to check out the film. And, uh, you know, we've really been doing this really grassroots kind of outreach because, uh, you know, the film's very meaningful to us uh, for many reasons. Um, but, but I'm really appreciative of your time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's go ahead and just get into it. Um, so one of the things that kind of struck me with Crisis is that it's got some beautiful shots. Like some of the cinematography and the scope uh, were kind of eye-catching. I was kind of like, oh, wow, just the beginning of it and also with uh, the score. Um, I think it's a, uh, what's it? What's it? Ralph Reed is doing the score? Raphael. Film? Yeah, Raphael. Raph, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a really interesting kind of like bringing you into the immersion of this situation that it's not just a one linear storyline it's multiple different storylines going on so i really was appreciative of the way that it was kind of executed just even in the beginning of it um well, i but, appreciate that because i've watched some of your reviews and i know that you get very into the cinematic aspects of the movies i do uh, so I do. you know not not too many do so uh, <laughs> so it's always nice to hear yeah absolutely and one of the things that was interesting to me, specifically with Army Hammer and uh, Evelyn Lilly's characters, is that they're so multi-layered. Like, they're not just like, oh, okay, this is my role as a mom and this is my role as a cop. You know, they have their own connections to whether it is drugs or distribution of them or even just the, the, the dark side of where this is kind of affecting them. Because Evelyn Lilly's character, she's a recovering addict. And then with... Army Hammer's character, his sister's still a recovering addict. And I, I, I really appreciated your approach to those two characters, but I was curious, honestly, um, did you at some point kind of like, you know, we could make this kind of a series. Uh, we could kind of blend, you know, we could take like just their storyline and just go straight from them and then kind of maneuver this around. Because the world and the way you kind of expanded them just as characters, I felt like could be honestly either a series or multiple different movies. I was just kind of curious um, why you were kind of creating their characters and where it was maneuvering. Were you ever thinking that way at any point? <clears throat> um, you know, I haven't yet. Um, I mean, look, I was trained, you know, I was trained as a feature filmmaker. So um, I have to be honest, you know, uh, I'm always just even trying to struggle to see if I could come up with two hours of interesting stuff to say. <laughs> so the idea of having to come up with 10 hours is like, oh my God. And I know that there are these creators that do it. You know, yeah. like the guy who wrote Downton Abbey, you know, mm -hmm. uh, he literally wrote every episode by himself. It's just yeah. him. And then he gives it to his wife and, and they made, you know, 20 episodes a year for five years. He wrote, so he wrote a hundred hours of stuff. And I, I mean, I just, I, you know, I, it takes me five months to just come up with a 120 page script. So quite <laughs> frankly, if I could, maybe I would, you know, cause hopefully I can get paid a little more per hour. Uh, but no, look, to be honest, I mean, uh, you know, there is of course the seminal series is The Wire, um, yeah. you know, about, about the drug issue in America, um, you know, this, and I think, you know, to, uh, that, that I just watched it again. You know, I watched mm -hmm. seasons one, three, and four. I don't know if you're a fan or not, uh, yeah. but you know, I mean, it, 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 it really does encompass, you know, all of the, the kind of law enforcement dysfunction. I mean, I definitely think, you know, some of the stuff that Gary Oldman's getting into the pharmaceutical side, that hasn't really been explored in the television series. I heard now my, my old friend Barry Levinson is actually gonna do uh, a television program called Dope Sick, looking mm. into uh, the pharmaceutical stuff in more depth. So, you know, uh, listen, if I, you know, if you had been there and said, Nick, uh, listen, I got the other eight, uh, 800 pages, you know, maybe we would have <laughs> done it. Or maybe you'll pitch me uh, Crisis the Series and, you know, <laughs> you can write it and I'll collect a producer fee. Do not tempt me because I am a side writer and a side director as well. So don't tempt me with a good well, time. Let's take it off the side. Let's make some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, again, uh, to Gary Oldman's characters, you know, I was kind of like, man, this has kind of got this like dark water feel. I don't know if you saw Dark yes, Water, absolutely. but I, I, loved, I loved how immersive and personal that became for that specific. I mean, it's, it's a tr true life situation, but this could easily be, even though the drug, I think itself, you kind of kind of created the name. Yes. Um, it felt very real. It felt like a situation that could be happening right now. And um, as far as even with all the other characters, there's kind of this feeling of like 
responsibility and justice and you know redemption and retribution it's all around the different characters and it kind of reminds me of uh like films like crash or traffic and i i really was kind of like this is really interesting the way you're kind of interweaving these different characters but i guess bleeding into that when you have like worked with character with, with actors like Richard Gere and Susan Sarandon and now like the amazing Gary Oldman like kind of how how did you feel about you know just being able to get him and um did you as far as his character was he always your ideal uh, actor for that specific role and just kind of how did how did that kind of come to be you know one time I was at a cocktail party um in Hollywood with my mom and there mm. was this famous uh, movie agent there. And she said to him, you know, she come, my mom has a will of her own. She sort of took him aside and she <laughs> said, you know, uh, she said, how come it's so hard for Nick to get films made? You know, why can't it just be? And he said, well, he said, you know, Ms. Heitzig, what you have to understand is in order for a film to come to be, it's like all of these things have to thread the eye of the needle at the same mm. time. You know, so you have to have a piece of material that people want to pay for and you have to have an actor, but that actor has to like it and feel that it's the moment in their career to look at that particular thing and all the director who can talk to them and the right. So all these things, you know, and then shh, you make a movie and that's why it's so hard because it's really hard for that alchemical thing to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case, Gary was really the stroke of luck. Um, mm -hmm. I had always been a fan of his, I mean, going back to, you know, Sid and Nancy or the professional, you know, I haven't got time, you know, like all that stuff. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, you know, Drexel and True Romance. I mean, he's done it all, right? And yeah. then Darkest Hour. So I saw Darkest yeah. Hour, wonderful performance. And sure enough, at another one of these Hollywood cocktail parties, somebody said, hey, Gary Oldman's gonna be there. Don't you wanna meet him? I said, okay, I'll be right over. So, uh, so I went and, and at the time I was working on another script and I, 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 you know, introduced, I was introduced and he was like, oh, I liked arbitrage. And he says, well, you know, uh, thank you for considering me. It would be uh, my pleasure to uh, have this opportunity. Um, and I was just like, <laughs> like, what kind of guy I was like, does he just hand that out? But then I looked and I saw to my right was Leonardo DiCaprio. And he was literally waiting for Gary to finish his conversation with me so that he could talk to Gary. And wow. so I was like, that's a, that's a, that's a G, you know, <laughs> I mean, then he was like taking the time, like, yes, I had a little bit of a pedigree of a filmmaker, but like still that he would give that much respect. So that's where our relationship began. We started working on that, but it, you know, that was a complex thing, but, but then the opioid thing was really coming to the front page of the papers. I unfortunately lost several friends to the opioid crisis and indeed had a friend in trouble at that time. So I was very inspired. I said, okay, all this information is coming out about you know, the kind of dark corners of power in the pharmaceutical companies, what they knew, did they know this was dangerous? So I said, okay, so I, I wrote the script very quickly, like four or five months, quick for me. Uh, but, uh, and then I called him, I said, listen, you know, I know we want to do the other thing, but we'll take a look. And he read it right away. And he was like, okay, let's go with this. This is so urgent. We'll do the, maybe we'll do the other thing or not, but we got to do this right now. He, he said, you know, I'm no stranger to addiction. He's been sober 24 years. He's lost people as well as everybody has, as we all have. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it felt like the right time. So then he came into the project as a producer. Um, he said, okay, so use my name and then go and get the other cast, get the money together, and then let me know when you got it, let's go. Uh, oh. And so, so that was a huge leg up. And that was really, Richard Gere had done the same thing for me with Arbitrage. I don't know why I have, I had a thing with Al Pacino also. I, it's not because of my good looks. Uh, you know, so I, I don't know. I have some affinity with these elder statesmen of film, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, haven't been able to crack the Denzel wall yet, but you know, it might get there one day. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, so that was the support that really kicked it off, you know, and then I went, you know, and started assembling the rest of the cast, uh, Lily and Hammer. And, and then I actually called, you know, at that point, once I had the cast solid, then I was like, okay, let me just see who else I can put in here. I was like, who is my, who are any of my friends for 20 years of running around Hollywood? Okay, I called Michelle Rodriguez. I called Cuddy. I called Lily Depp. I called Greg Kinnear, who's my brother's friend from growing up. And I was like, I got no money. Can you come to Canada? Let's do this movie. You know, but everybody was like, so you asked me what it was like. Everybody was like, Nick, I'll be there. What time do you need me there? Uh... And I think it's because for each person, they also had a personal 
connection to the, to yeah, opioid addiction. To you know, mm -hmm. everyone knows somebody. So so I so I felt blessed uh, and supported by this cast. You know, um, and that's, and they really gave it themselves for so little. You know, uh, actors yeah. make a big sacrifice sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. And, and speaking of like just immersing themselves into the character, like honestly, Evelyn Lilly's character and her performance probably, honestly was my favorite that she's ever done was in Priceless. I, I think she was just completely immersed into it. And I bought everything that she was bringing to the table. And same thing for Army Hammer's character. But I was, I was curious, as far as both of them, how much rigorous like prep did they kind of go through of kind of understanding the characters or what did you kind of let them know like look this is where you need to kind of focus on i'm just really curious what kind of work they had to kind of put in to get the performance out of what they got so so honestly quite a bit um i was a big fan i was also a big fan of the director sydney lumet you know who did the verdict dog day afternoon serpico you know all these great films in the 70s and i read his biography it's called making movies it came out in the 90s and so he talked about making Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino and John Cazale and like these incredible actors. And so he did a process on that movie and it really spoke to me where he started with the script, then he got the actors together. He would go off with them one-on-one -on -one, and he would just start doing a tape recorder and doing it, running through the script. And, and, but this would go on for like weeks. And so in it, what he would do is he would allow the actors to really say, you know what, I wouldn't come in there. I don't think, it doesn't make any sense. I already had the bag, like what, you know, and they said, okay, well, what would you do? And so it became like an extended conversation. And then at the end of the night, he would take the tapes, he'd get a secretary, I, I, I don't have a secretary, but he'd get a secretary to type up the tapes and then make new pages from that. And so I tried wow. that on arbitrage and I spent a month rehearsing with Richard Gere. He would come over to the table we're sitting at now every day for a month and we would just go through the script but also talk and talk about, you know, what are we trying to say with this movie? What does, mm -hmm. can, who does he base this character on? So we did the same thing here. I didn't have the luxury of a month because I was in Canada, but actually we used Skype. This was pre, pre COVID. So it's pre zoom. Uh, <laughs> and I would get on Skype uh, with the actors. Cause uh, you know, Evie Evangeline was in uh, uh, Hawaii where she lives. Gary was shooting in LA. Um, and you know, Cuddy was doing like Coachella, whatever. But so I would get, I started with Skype, and then I managed to bring everyone in for a week with each person, you know. And then we would sit and do that same process where and rehearsal. So I call it rehearsal, but you know, it's not hey, say the lines, Joe. You know, go. It's not that at all. It's like we could be going to dinner. We could be talking about a past experience. Um, now the other thing I do a lot of is research. So when I'm writing the script, everything in this movie happened. The, you know, it, I changed the names, I changed the scenarios, but there was a professor, he was at a university, there was a chemical company, they did try to discredit him, they did bring up harassment allegations, they had internal memos saying they needed to destroy this guy, you know, yeah. uh, this was a big academic. The cop stuff, these cartels, I had an undercover uh, police advisor, Steve Opperman, he was the Hammer character in Los Angeles, uh, he he took down these uh, syndicates that were Armenian, no no prejudice against Armenians, but uh, mm -hmm. they just happened to be Armenian who were doing cross-border smuggling. There were biker gangs in Canada making uh, counterfeit fentanyl. Um, and, wow. and, and so he, you know, and the Evangeline thing, that, that was a little more imagined, but, you know, there, 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 uh, there was a news article I read while I was writing the script, true story, a boy crossed the snow from Canada to America was caught with half a million dollars of pills on a sled. Uh, so I just, you know, I, I just figure like stick with the truth and just took it all and just kind of tried to make it into a story. I mean, it helps because again, like I said, I'm kind of uh, lazy and, and also not that imaginative. So it's good <laughs> to have these blocks, uh, you know, to build on. So the good thing was with the actors, I put Army together with Steve. I had Steve, Steve loved to come over. He's a six foot six, half Asian, half Jewish. Like, I don't know what he is. He's some bizarre, he got a huge ponytail. He's one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. And we would go and he'd come over every day and he loves guns. So he had like a bag with like 20 guns, he had an Uzi and an AK and Glocks. Of course, Army loved all that stuff. But we'd go down to the pill mills in LA, um, yeah. you know, and, and where he had busted the places. And he had all the case files of Armin Metakalan. And, 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 you know, and he told me these stories about like doctors they caught who were writing fake prescriptions. He had one guy 
he, he, he came in and the guy's writing prescriptions. The DEA is raiding his office and he's like so high on his own pills and madness. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what do you need, guys? You need a prescription? You know, so I had all this stuff from Steve. So I put Steve there. I had pharmaceutical executive to coach Gary. And, to go, and then I, you know, the stuff with Evangeline actually, interestingly, was based on uh, a family member of mine was murdered like 50 years ago. Oh, um, so and uh, and the mother, I never knew him. I mean, he's dead before I'm alive. But uh, his uh, his mother, who I did know, they had figured out who did it, but the cops had not yet arrested him. So he the the mother used to drive. This is in Michigan. This is part of why I put the film in Detroit. The mother used to drive and sit out parked outside the guy's house and watch him like coming out on his porch. And I remember my mom telling me that story, uh, and it just kind of stayed with me. And I thought, you know, what if you were a woman? Who had who was you know look looked like you had it all your architect you get pulled it all together but somehow you've got an injury you've got these pills maybe you've got stuff in your past that's bothering you you know and you go down this road of addiction and then now something happens to your kid and it, is it your fault you know the guilt that you could feel uh, and then no no I don't want to believe that he would never do anything like that Min, in, meanwhile inside she's like oh my god he I stole my pills. So I would kill myself, you know. So, so I don't know that that that. So, so you know. And then Evangeline, uh, you know, uh, she she went to all these Narcotics Anonymous meetings. I I told her go. I said just go in. You can go. You know. She's like, well, can I sit there? I'm like, of course you can sit there. It's open to anybody. Uh, And so she she went and she you know learned all about addiction from the inside. And I think like that opening scene with her in the uh, in the Narcotics meeting you know, has like a wonderful authenticity and she, she, she played it really well. I love what she did. She, she's very method. So it was a dark experience for her, but uh, yeah. she pulled it off. Yeah. Sorry, I'm no. so long winded. No, 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 no. You gave me everything I was really kind of looking for, honestly. Um, so let's see, your, this film came out 2020 technically, and then your last film came out 2012. So I'm curious have you been writing on anything else? Now, I think I did see something about fuel. I don't know if that is being lingering, but I was curious, what, where do you want to go from crisis? Like, where, what, where, do you, where is your approach? Do you feel like you have a certain niche that you want to kind of move towards? I was just really curious and pick your brain. Yeah, with. I mean, uh, you know, I was actually talking with a friend of mine. We did his podcast and he, he also asked me about some old projects and you know i i the best i could come up with is like sort of they're like old lovers you know uh Uh that 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 you lost you know because you you want like i wrote five movies you never heard of you know that i tried to get made and for whatever reason Mm -hmm. the needle didn't go through um Mm -hmm. so so there was fuel there was american lightning with gary and hugh jackman there was uh, you know, this one with Michael B. Jordan. So uh, there, you know, there, there are uh, the one with Jim Carrey that, you know, there are a whole bunch that have, that, that almost were. Uh, uh-huh. And so it's a little bit of a death each time. So thinking back on them, I think it's sort of like thinking back on past relationships, you maybe oh better gosh. not done. Um, and, uh, but for the future, I mean, look, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm like, I'm excited about film, but I'm concerned about film because okay. You know, we saw before uh, COVID, you know, the studios were really, you know, they had been following a pattern, which was to just cut down the number of movies they make every year. You know, they used to, each studio used to make 25 movies a year, at least. Yep. And then they went down and, you know, and then they got to about a dozen. And then even like Disney started getting wild and being like, we're going to make six movies this year. But each movie is going to cost $500 million. And because it costs $500 million, it needs to have a lot of action and not too much talking so that we don't have to put yeah. subtitles and they don't have to dub too much and don't make it too complicated. And then by the way, you know, sanitize it to make sure nobody is offended. And then we've got, it put a lot of visual effects in it. And now we've got this eminently marketable product that we can just push out. Oh, by the way, it also has to be existing IP that we've owned for 80 years. So give me a Marvel, give me a DC, get, you know? Yeah. And so at a certain point you're like, okay, I get it. I get it. It's a money printing machine. It's working, but it's also like a little bit exhausting if you like, mm-hmm. you know, films and like, I know you appreciate cinema because you like cinematic technique, camera and, and score. Uh, so, you know, so you're like, well, where are those films? So I guess the answer is, well, they kind of moved to television 
You know, yep. now you can watch, you know, uh, Euphoria or you can watch this, you know, whatever. Uh, but but I miss that that cinema. You know, I miss that, you know, uh, I mean, John Singleton was a friend of mine who passed away. You know, mm. would Boys in the Hood even be made now? You know, or they'd say like, oh, no, it's got to be a TV show, John, you know. Yeah. Uh, so so, you know, that that was um, that was like a breakthrough film when I was a young man. So. Uh, I don't know. Uh, now, look, on the other hand, we saw some extraordinary films this year. I love mm -hmm. Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, mm -hmm. I think I may have written you about that. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, that for me was like, you know, because it was cinematic, because of the opening shot where he comes in the bar and say, you know, and Lakeith, I, by the way, I tried to get Lakeith in crisis. I, he was almost there, but didn't work mm -hmm. out. But uh, I had I'd written another part for him. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that was very alive. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a couple other films I saw that were alive, uh, but but I don't know. I, you know, so I, I guess I, I like these kind of thrillery films that are you know social issues, like you mentioned. You know, Crash or you know I love like Twenty One Grams was really cool. Yeah. I mean, I love The Insider too, but like The Insider didn't even make any money back in its day. It didn't. Uh, it didn't. You know, so 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 these films have always been a tough sell, but I guess you know it's getting tougher in a way. I mean, I'm working on something now. You know. Uh, I just got the most incredible actress to agree to star in it. It's a tale of a woman in the military, you know, fighting the glass ceiling and, and who changed, you know, it's a true story. I don't want to say too much because of what I'm going to say. This woman is a top star and was just nominated for an Academy Award. So she was one of those people that were just on TV. We can't get the money, you know, nobody wants to do it. Uh, oh, why? Oh, it's too much, uh, too talky, uh, it's too cerebral. I'm a cerebral, half the movie takes place in a Black Hawk helicopter. Um, wow. So I don't know. I don't know where it's going. I'm, I, I, I want to keep fighting for it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and I want to keep fighting for cinemas as well because, you know, I don't only want to watch Godzilla versus Kong in the theater. Exactly. And I definitely want to comment on that because I review, you know, I review everything. Um, yeah. One of the biggest things is that they've been trying to remove a lot of the indie or specific based stories that I used to personally love all the time. Like, you don't want to always just go see a Marvel movie, like you say, or a big budget film. You want to kind of like have a movie that make you think, but it doesn't have you have a big budget. And so I think that now you might be in an even better place because of the way the world is. Yes, there's a lot of shows that are coming out, but I think that like the Amazon Primes, the Apple TV Plus, um, I mean, even HBO Max technically to a regard, and of course Netflix, there are places now for films of all shapes and sizes to be. And I think that that's where the selling point, I think that's where the shift is actually going to go. Um, sadly, and at the same time, fortunately, because that means that expression of film doesn't die. And that's what I, 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 I hate, you know, as a director, as a, as a creator myself, like, I hate the idea that, oh, man, whatever I, this amazing idea I feel that somebody is going to feel something from can never be made because it's never going to be received. And I think that there's a place now that people have been looking at some amazing films. Some of the best films that got nominated for Oscars, they didn't even go to the theaters or it was a limited run. They, most people saw them at home or POV, POVD. And um, I think that, I think your, your day is coming. No, no pun intended. Well, so I, thank you. But, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, look, it's a battle worth fighting, you know, uh, when I was a young man just starting, I wrote this, uh, I wanted to be a film director and I, it was impossible to be a film director, couldn't get any information. So mm. my mom said, well, what are you gonna do about it? I said, okay, well, if I could get 20 directors, I'd put them in a book and I'd ask them how they became film directors. And she said, well, why don't you do that? So I mm. said, not a bad idea. So I went and I wrote, the first thing I ever did, I wrote a book called Breaking In, How 20 Film Directors Got Their Start. And I interviewed these 20 different directors, um, mm. you know, uh, John Carpenter, Ed Zwick, Kimberly Pierce. But I remember Carpenter said to me, so we go to do this interview at Musso and Frank Grill. I'd never been out to Hollywood. I'm like in a rental car, like trying to figure out how to drive because I'm from New York, so I don't know how to drive. And, uh, and anyway, I get there. I got there all late, so he was all pissed off. But finally, we do the interview. And I remember he says at the beginning of the interview, he's talking about some problems he's having in filmmaking, getting the film financed or distributed. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting this business soon anyway. And I'm like, 
like thinking like, what? Like, what is he talking about? So we end up doing yeah. the interview and it all goes great. And, uh, uh, you know, and then finally he's like, walk me out of the parking lot and he's encouraging me. And he's like, you know, why have you written some scripts? I'm like, well, I wrote one. He's like, you know, I had to write like 10 scripts before I sold one. He's like, why don't mm -hmm. you try writing more? You should write more. I'm like, okay. And then, uh, and I said, well, so what are you going to do? And he's like, uh, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you said you're, you're, you're quitting the film business. So what are you going to do? And he's like, oh, that, no, that's just talk. I just always say that. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess this is, you know, on the mind of every filmmaker, given the struggle to get these things done. But, yeah. um, but I think it is worth hanging in. Yeah. Because it's yeah. an important art form and it's a beautiful, beautiful way to express these ideas and, and to, to, to get audiences to interact with them you know, and create discussion, whether it's about the opioid topic or women in the military or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have any other further questions. Um, I appreciate you for, you know, uh, allowing me to be able to interview you. I feel honored. Um, I pray for success for you moving forward. <laughs> with your Thank you. Project. Yeah. The, the, uh, you know, this film has actually done, done well. It's got out to audiences. We were number one on iTunes for like almost 10 days, which is I a big deal. That. Only four movies did this, this year. We just came out on Blu-ray and, but you know, the other interesting thing with the pandemic is we've only opened in 20% of the places we're going to open. So we opened America, Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan. Everywhere else oh. is still closed for COVID. So we got UK, Italy, oh. Spain, Germany, Japan, Hong Kong, you know, uh, where I, I, China, uh, you know, so it's like they're, they're going to see this movie, I guess, as COVID permits, uh, because, yeah. you know, a lot of them are still doing the traditional cinema run and they're just waiting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so, you know, we, we just keep it going and uh, get the word out there. And, and, and then you and I will be working on uh, the Crisis, the TV show. I cannot confirm or deny anything. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I appreciate your time, Nicholas. Thank you Thank so you. much. I you really go by Sam or Samuel? It. My wife calls me Samuel. Everybody else calls me Sam. <laughs> okay. You can call me Sam. That's fine. Okay. Well, Sam, thank you very much. I, I, this is uh, really, really helps us out getting the word out there. Yeah. It's no problem, buddy. Take care. Okay. Okay. A pleasure. We'll talk again. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you later. All right, man. Thank All right, you. Peace. You had my son run drugs for you. This Why is the biggest public health crisis since tobacco. It's not our responsibility. Then whose is it? You cannot walk into that by alone. We can't quit. We can't stop. What do you think we're here to do? To make a difference? We can touch you anywhere in the world. We're running out of time. Last chance.